Hey, Pre-Sales Collective, it's your host, James Kakis. And today I'm going to be joined by Jeff Margulies, Senior Vice President, Global Solutions Consulting at ServiceNow. Today's episode is titled, A Pre-Sales Journey. Usually I have a topic and I bring a guest on to talk about that topic, but not today. I wanted to bring Jeff on to talk about all things pre-sales, what he learned along the way, some of the things that he did that have propelled him to a global solutions role. He has a massive organization of over 1,400 people and is even tasked with adding multiple hundreds of people to his org next year. And so what matters to Jeff in that type of situation? You're going to hear his thoughts on orgs, global strategies, and really our favorite conversation, having a seat at the table. Enjoy. Today's episode is sponsored by Consensus. Scale your pre-sales organization with interactive video demos. Experience an interactive demo at goconsensus.com. Jeff, good morning. How's it going? Welcome to the Pre-Sales Podcast. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you, James. Thanks for having me. Thanks for giving us your time. How's 2021 going for you? Professionally, I should ask. Yeah, the world's got some interesting things going on. But professionally, uh, yeah, you know, it's great. Uh, We just finished our fiscal year here. We're fiscal calendar over at ServiceNow. And we're getting prepared for the new year. So we've got sales kickoffs coming up like most companies do. But uh, over here at ServiceNow, we also do what's called a tech summit that we're preparing for. And that is a fairly unique thing. It's just for the solution consulting slash pre-sales community. And it's our kickoff. So that starts next week. I love that you guys have your own kickoff. I actually want to dig on this, but I'm going to wait till I dig on this because that's a really interesting topic. Before we get started, Jeff, I want to hear about your pre-sales journey because I think you've got a really amazing path and you've worked for some really great companies. And so tell us how you got into pre-sales. It was an interesting journey. When I came out of college, I was a program. I loved coding. I mean, I had my VIC-20 when it was probably 1982, 1983. And I was doing some basic coding using the basic language and recording it on cassettes. I know old stuff for you young guys, but I just love that stuff. So I went to college. I got my computer science degree, came out, did 10 years worth of programming. And one of the last big development jobs that I worked on we started using a product called Power Builder, which is long gone at this point, but it was a good for GL language. And the sales rep for Power Builder would come by every once in a while and get us to use their products and buy them, et cetera. I kind of dawned on me because, you know, the rep was great and all, but really didn't have all the proper knowledge. And the sales rep finally brought along the quote unquote smart person which turned out to be their pre-sales engineer. And I really got to be friendly with him. And to this day, I actually still keep up with him after about 25 years. And I kind of looked at that role and I was like, "Ah, that's pretty interesting. You get to talk about what they do. You get to get your hands dirty technically, but I don't have to get up in the middle of the night to take a call because our production systems went down. To be honest, I kind of wanted to get away from that a little bit, right? That was not the most appealing part being a uh, programmer. And so, uh, you know, I got really lucky that right after the 2000.com bust, not the boom part, the bust part, (laughs) a friend of mine was a pre-sales leader over a company called Web Methods. And he was looking for a pre-sales engineer. And I'd known him for a long time. I'd done some coding with him. And he was like, hey, you want to try and do this? And I was like, absolutely. I don't want to do the programming thing anymore. And, you know, kind of took off from there. And it was, it was a great opportunity. Web Methods was a really good company at the time, in particular because they had a really good product, but it also taught me a lot of things as well. So that's a pretty solid technical fundamental background. Did you use that as a leader? Did it help you hit the ground running as a leader? Because there's a lot of leaders now that don't have much of a tech background. It's just people leader experience. I mean, I find that if you're going to do pre-sales leadership, so two different things, individual contributor versus the leader side, that... You know, having some form of technical background is not a bad thing. I guess I look at it maybe from a couple of different vectors. One, our sales counterparts do look at the pre-sales leadership as the technical backstop. So I'll give you a perfect example. Today, my counterpart on the sales side is the chief revenue officer. I mean, he's not calling me on a daily basis about, you know, what is the technical aspects of our product, but he does do that. He does expect that even I have to understand what our product set to do, the value propositions, et cetera, and have an opinion on its technical direction. He knows I'm not open the whole thing up and coding at the down low levels. And we got a thousand people that go and do that kind of stuff and a pro serve arm. And heck, we got engineering you can go and talk to if he really wants to find out what's happening. 
But he does expect, and I agree with this, that myself and every other person that's in the Oregon pre-sales leadership is acting like the sort of CTO of their own little regions. I just happen to run the world. So I get to do it a little bit at that level. And like I said, there's a lot more smarter people than I on that side. So I think it's important from that perspective that you have some kind of grounding. And I really I want maybe two of these other areas together. One, you want to go and talk to customers. You better have something in you that says, hey, I understand what these things do. Now, I think it will depend on the kind of product you might be selling. Some software products are much more deep technical than others that are being sold at a more business level. And especially in the cloud days today, when I went to VMware, you had to get into a lot of the how. How does that work? How does it connect? What is the integration? Does it connect to this HBA and that server? And, you know, does it support this level operating system? You know, we don't do that at a SaaS company. You kind of go, hey, listen, it's cloud. Let's pay us for it. Don't worry about all that stuff. But integration typically comes up and you got to understand how that works and how you're going to fundamentally go and work with other systems, et cetera. And then there's the team. I don't find you can somewhat get respect from the broad team if you don't have at least some form of basis and have the ability to do intelligent conversations around your own product set. It's the one thing I talk and teach to our own leaders too, like respect your craft and understand what we do. I know you can somewhat get by in leadership with like, yeah, you know, I kind of know what the products do. Like, and then again, I'm, I'm not saying go get your admin certification on every single product line that you might have within your own company, but it's good to understand what they do. You can have intelligent conversations. So you went from web methods to VMware where you were there for over nine years. Is that correct? Yeah, almost 10 years. What was that experience like? I imagine that there was a lot of growth during those nearly 10 years. Definitely a lot of growth. And I was a much younger man with a lot less experience, but maybe that was a good thing, right? I mean, as a perspective, <laughs> VMware, I started there in 05. They only had two products really at the time, which was the desktop product workstation that a lot of people loved and know, and I think it's still around today. And then uh, ESX was, they don't even call it that anymore. It still is there underneath the covers, but uh, which is vSphere today. That was really the only products that they had. You know, today they sell so many things. I couldn't even tell you what they've got over there. But, you know, we were a relatively small company. I think we had four or 500 employees. I was running the, what they called the South Central, which um, someone was very confused with their geography because I live in Texas and South Central went all the way to the Canadian border. So I had a 14 state territory that ran from sort of Texas up to the Wyoming, Montana area. And we only had five SEs to cover the entire thing. We had no segmentation. And one day you could talk to Walmart. Walmart was in our patch at the time, which is, you know, big company, obviously. And then the other day, literally, as I used to jokingly say, you'd go and talk to Joe's Garage because they had a workstation. So it was like the wild, wild west of that. Having, you know, five SEs and running all over the place. And, you know, you definitely had to do player coach because of the volume that we were doing there. You know, a rep needed someone to help out. You just had to jump in. We weren't really pooled. And that's where I guess I kind of learned some of that too. Due to the vast geography, pooling was impossible. What are you going to pool a, an SC in Dallas with one in Denver? Like the geography just doesn't support it and the volumes weren't there. So we went all one-to-one -one. and their model was originally set up for that, which is how kind of I got my sort of started into going, mm, I like this one-to-one -one thing if you do it right and if you have the right investment, obviously. But that's really where it started. You're right. Having the right investment is big. So what was pre-sales at VMware like 15 years ago? Was it much different than it was today or beyond a little bit of the Wild West component you mentioned? I would say I was extremely fortunate to join a company like VMware that at its time, and I think they're doing great today. I haven't been there in six years though, but the product was undeniable. If we got the right meeting, which wasn't that hard, honestly, at the time in the 06, 7, 8, 9 timeframe, we had no competitor. The product had such a CapEx oriented value proposition and technical advantage that all you had to do is get a meeting with the director of um, data center, IT, enterprise architecture, you name it, one of those types of titles. And our demos would not be that PowerPoint, let me show you on my laptop, be like, no, no, let me put it into one of your servers. And I'll try it out in your environment because we had such trust that the product would work. We would show them vMotion, which is the ability to move machines around without them going down, et cetera, and the ability to control and create them and add a CPU on the fly, you know, all these pretty deep infrastructure technical things. And within an hour, they'd be like, what? Are you serious? Like, this is real? And we'd be like, yeah, how many references would you like to get? And 
we would use two tactics. One, we would give them, people loved Workstation. Workstation wasn't what we were selling. It was all the data center products. I used to keep these little paper certificates in my backpack and it would be a free Workstation license. We would give them that as part of the marketing hook. And that was the way to kind of get back to them. And then literally within a month, they probably were buying the software. It was so technically advanced and worked so well and provided so much value that Obviously, that's all changed now. There's lots of competition. The cloud's here, da, 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 da. But I just was fortunate that the product, I'm not saying it sold itself. You still have to explain what it did, the value propositions of it, the why. We focused a lot on the why back then. But once we got to that, it was how fast can we get it? How fast can we rip our servers out of our data centers? That's proof right before your eyes. I mean, there's no BS in selling some snake oil at that point. So that's incredible. So you went to product marketing for a little bit after that. Is that right? Yeah. So I stayed in the pre-sales world and grew that team. You know, the original five eventually, oh, I don't know, there was probably 50, 60 SEs in those teams with a, you know, a couple of directors. And they eventually even finally learned what the geography was like and pared it down to South Central is probably more like Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, lovingly referred to as Tola. And, you know, I've been doing that for a long time. And luckily, you know, VMware is still growing significantly in the 2011 timeframe. And they had some programs, which I was involved with, called the uh, Leadership Development Program, which offered, one, a lot of training outside of being just pre-sales. You were grouped with all kinds of people from engineering, marketing, HR, sales, etc. And then they really were like, hey, if you're interested in trying other things within the company, we'll sort of post those opportunities to the Leadership Development Program. And if there's a fit, you can move into another role. And I talked to my boss at the time and I was like, you know, I wouldn't mind trying something different. I've been doing the same thing for seven, eight years. I, we're doing well. And big thing too, I had built a good leadership team underneath me that it was going to be easy to have somebody take my role or switch things around. I forget what they ended up doing, to be honest with you. But I saw the product marketing gig and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. It's still got a technical spin to it. I kind of always had loved the marketing aspects of it. And they were very amenable to me trying that. And I moved into the uh, product marketing group. Now, the specific component of it was I was running competitive marketing at the time. When I started with VMware, no competition. By 2011, 2012, the competition was coming at us from every angle and specifically Microsoft was all over the place. Hi, everybody talked about Hyper-V and it's free and it's good enough and blah, blah, blah. So I was out there to prove that, no, it's free like a puppy. Wait till you get that thing home <laughs> and that it's not the same as us. Anyway, yeah, I did that for about two years. So, you know, after the product marketing role, you went to ServiceNow as a solutions consulting leader. Did that product marketing experience make you a better solutions leader, especially focusing on compete? You know, it was interesting when I was doing the uh, first rounds of interviews that came up more in that, like, so are you going to be able to do this job? And I was like, no, trust me, I'm good here. I got this. Yeah, I did the two years of product marketing, but I'm a pre-sales guy. I won't go home. <laughs> the experience in product marketing helped because I had knowledge of sort of that, how did the sausage get made? I wasn't in R&D or anything, but I was arm's length or a lot closer to the R&D groups, product management. How do we price our products? How do we package them? And it gave me sort of that inherent knowledge of like, oh, which you typically don't see in the larger software companies. There's like this sort of, not in a negative way, but this imaginary wall between the field, you know, the sales teams. And you're like, well, somebody builds the products. I don't know. That's kind of over there. I don't know really what they do over there. And then you kind of know typically a little bit of product management and product marketing folks. And that's about it, right? Whereas I was fortunate to be able to go deep into that other side and really understand how things work, how do products go to market, how do they create positioning, et cetera. And then it provides much tighter feedback. Or even today, like we have a new SVP of product marketing and you know, I can have a little deeper conversation with him because I know a little bit more of that terminology that they like to use in marketing. So how big was ServiceNow when you joined? Because you've had four rules in your six years there. Is that correct? Well, yes and no. So ServiceNow is about, I don't know, I'll guess that at like 2,200, 2,300 employees at the time, which today, or we finished the year, give or take around 13,000. So we've hired, you know, 11,000 people since then. The team that I originally took on when I started in early 2005, I was running the America's field team. That's the initial role that I took on. And we had about, I think it was around 150 people in that team at the time. And then uh, if you took that team today, it's probably got about 450 sitting in it. So it's three times the size at this point. 
And then the title changes have occurred there, but there's really only been two roles. I moved from running the Americas to running the globe. And that started wow. about two years ago. So today I run the global solution consulting team. So it's all the field, all the specialty, our design studios, our architects, et cetera. And it's a group of about 1,200 or so. What was the biggest difference for you going from an America's leader to a worldwide leader? There's probably two big differences. Now, the Americas did include Canada, U.S., Latin America, and I grew up in Canada, so I clearly understood, well, I understood kind of that marketplace. I hadn't worked there in a long time. There's nowhere like the U.S. market. It's so large and has so much diversity in it. It provides a ton of experience to go and deal with other places. But I had done, you know, a decent amount of stuff with Latin America in Brazil and Mexico is where we have a lot of our folks. But I'd say there's two or three big differences. One, you get into the globe and you realize like, wow, it's a big world. All right. You got all these time zones and, you know, that's easy to kind of figure out. But the way people sell and relate in other countries due to their culture, their backgrounds, or even their local markets, right? We might have different competitors out in Japan. By the way, we do. We have companies out there that over here are like, what? Never even heard of these companies. So learning some of that, you know, it, it takes a little time. It's not that difficult. Don't assume you have that experience, as an example, if you've come out of a U.S.-based team. Like, oh, we've done everything, all right, because of our size and scope and scale. That's not necessarily the case. And then the way people sell, it is a little bit different when you move to some other countries. And, and a good example that's not so unique, I'll say, to ServiceNow, so not proprietary, Europe is a great example. Europe is highly channel driven. You don't do so much direct with customers. You still talk to them directly, et cetera, but there tends to be a little bit more focus on the channel than there is in the US. We have a channel model here too, but you just tend to do a lot more partner oriented, partner focused selling and integration in Europe than you would do here. Japan has some similarity to that as well. But yet, you know, like I said, the U.S. is not nearly as much. So it's just a good compare contrast to doing some of those. And then probably the other big thing of the differences between for over here running Americas versus the globe, I now have the specialty organization. So we've got a fairly large, I'll use sort of that old term of overlay SC team. We've got a team about 400 overlay SEs over here and then a couple other smaller groups. So I was focused just on field for a long time, but now I had to add all these new things in, right? They're different for sure than running field teams. Really appreciate you sharing that. I mean, it's really interesting to hear how you go from Americas and have those teams. I mean, Canada and Latin America probably give you that good experience, but adding the rest of the globe definitely changes things. I worked for European-based companies and with European-based companies for most of my startup experience. And that was the biggest thing. And that was even for pre-sales collective. We said, hey, we didn't want to be this pre-sales collective that says we're a global community that just sits in the US and talks to the US and says that we're global. It's a big difference. The regional differences really surprised me. And you know, even to your point, James, a couple of years ago, I was trying to seek out getting more experience with Europe in particular. It's by far our second largest market to the US. And I started doing more research online and trying to meet outside of even service now, pre-sales people in Europe. It was good to, you know, get on calls with all Europeans and kind of learn from them a little bit. It's definitely different marketplaces. And no, not one is better or right or wrong, by the way. It's, they're just different and that's fine. What would you say was probably the biggest surprise for you went from the Americas to the global role? Or did you plan on doing something and then you started to do it and you're like, oh, wow, this is way different than I anticipated? Yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily a surprise, but I'm a high relationship guy and try to use, you know, my, well, I don't have boyish charm, but, you know, ability to connect with people at a fairly personal level. You know, I had done, I think, fairly well with that with the Americas, but I realized quickly like, ooh, that's a bit of an American thing. When you go and try and do that in Europe, it might work in some places, but it's just a difference in culture when you're going to go try and personally connect with someone in Japan, as an example. Japanese have a very interesting culture that's highly hierarchical. And with me, with the title that I have, getting someone in Japan to try to personally connect with you, and I'm a huge fan of personal connection, is difficult because they still just see you as the you know VP of the world or whatever the title is. It takes some work to reset your brain to attempt to do that. And then some of the things that I would normally use, they just won't work. 
And you got to be very mindful of that. I love being a student of the world and learn about other cultures. And, and hey, listen, the easiest, best way that unfortunately we can't do right now is go have lunch, dinner, breakfast. I mean, there's just nothing like doing that in a foreign country. Something I've always done. If I'm going to a foreign place, I'm like, hey, I'd love to meet your spouse, your family, come to your house if possible, if it's you know amenable, because you want to see what's it like. And I find right now, especially with like the pandemic, a lot of folks that are living in, I'd say, smaller countries are more densely populated. Their workspaces are vastly different than what we have here in the U.S. To us, working at home is like, yeah, it's no big deal. Like, I'll use my office. I'll go to the living room. You go think about somebody in Japan or maybe that's living in downtown London or something. They live very small spaces and they might be sitting on their bed with an ironing board and that's their desk. Like, whew. You know, with three roommates and God knows what. <laughs> and my heart goes out to them to have to go do that, right? I appreciate that perspective. Switching gears a little bit, Jeff. As an executive leader, what do you spend most of your time caring about? Well, I mean, it goes in a couple buckets, probably. I mean, one, uh, my boss would kill me if I didn't say this one. I'm okay with that. I care about the number. All right. <laughs> Make the freaking number. My team knows when I put up our priorities, doesn't matter the year. Number one priority, go make the number, right? You can't do good until you do well, okay? Quote from our, our CEO, I love that one, right? So past that, you know, I don't know, it's things like the team. I really care about our team and making sure things like we want to keep our attrition low, keep the folks happy. Are they able to do their jobs? Then everything from, do they know the current products? Because we're releasing, you know, in a SaaS business, you're constantly releasing products. So are we training them properly? Do they know how to go to market with it? Do they have all the right tools and skills? And, you know, there's a whole list that kind of goes with that. You know, and then making sure our customers are happy. At ServiceNow, we pride ourselves on a very high NPS score and the highest renewal rates in the industry. But it's no easy task to keep those up. I believe the pre-sales org has a huge hand in that, even though some of those can be fairly post-sales oriented. There's no defined line between the two of those. You've got to make that part of your job. So, you know, we're always looking and worrying about those kinds of things. Something that is always up for discussion in pre-sales is who should we report to? You and I have talked about this on a number of occasions. You are the only person in your organization that reports to a sales leader. Is that correct? And why? That is correct. Yes. I report to the chief revenue officer, but the entire global org does report in. I view it in a couple of ways and there's not necessarily a right or wrong, but it's a personal opinion, I guess. So why do I like it and having it just report to the top one? That means we have a seat at the table. So when decisions are being made as an example around headcount and where's it going to go and what's it going to look like and what are we going to invest in? If it goes too far down and it sits in just the quote unquote sales side, so not an uncommon thing or a fairly common thing you see in the industry is America's general manager of sales will have a VP of pre-sales reporting to them. Not uncommon, but that means then that the quote unquote headcount decisions and the layout and the investments are being done at just that level. Well, I like to kind of push that higher up or as high up as you can go. So again, it's not a terrible thing, but I just think it provides us with more opportunities when it's done at the highest levels. And then there's this true seat at the table. Otherwise, I think what happens a lot of times is pre-sales gets lumped in with sales. You'll hear that a lot of times. Like, oh, it's uh, the sales teams. I'm like, well, do you mean the sales teams or the pre-sales teams? I mean, because to me, they're very distinct. Yes, we sell together. We're teamed and I love that and et cetera, et cetera. But which side would you like to talk to? Because they're very different in what we do, how we do things, how we're paid even for that matter. And I want the proper seat at the table because then you get treated like the true first class citizen that we should be. And I think it has been a struggle over the years. And I think, you know, I know for us here at ServiceNow, we don't have these struggles per se, but you can see it in some organizations where you're just fighting for everything which it shouldn't be. It's hard enough to go compete with your competitors and prove what the value of the products are. I don't want to have to go fight internally as to why I'm justifying my job here. I'm literally going to bold that and put that all over the pre-sales collective because that's like been our topic for months. Why should we have to continue to justify our, our existence? It's crazy at this point. It's 2021. And we know that this role is important, but we're still having these conversations. So I think that's why the pre-sales collective, we're trying to say 2021 is the year of the pre-sales professional. And for those that are like, oh, every year is a year of the pre-sales. Like it is to us, but we need to make sure it is to everybody else. 
You bring up a really good point, Jeff, about see the executive tables. So what do you do to ensure that your org has that seat and you're not getting lumped in with just sales? It's a good question, but I'll start with a point that you can add to the way you portray everything there with the seat at the table, which is the sales team, they will not just give it to you either. That's, I think, the other side of it. Sometimes we're like, well, come on, we're really good at this and we should get all these things like, "Mm, no. Okay, think about how this works. Quota comes down, gets layered onto a sales team, and that quota is set because they got to go pay for everything plus the fact we want to grow the company and all these other things. So essentially, you're fighting somewhat with the marketing person, the engineering person, HR, finance, et cetera, for you know, money and resources in a small little way. I mean, in growing companies, it's not so bad. But don't assume the sales teams are going to just give it to you. Yeah, I mean, any good sales team knows, hey, we need some pre-sales people. But if you allow it to be an afterthought, it will be an afterthought. And so more to now your question of what do we do? To me, it's don't just be the demo monkey, the POC God, the product expert. By the way, you need to be all three of those. Don't forget that. That to me is like the cost of entry. To me, it's things like get involved in the forecast, understand how we mature our pipeline or even build the pipeline. Get into things like pipeline generation, okay? Now, we're not the marketing team, but to me, marketing, and maybe that's why eventually I went and tried product marketing, to me, they're my best friends. I love the marketing teams. We'll just lump them all together for a second instead of going through all their roles. But why not at your local regional level, who knows best than you about what customers might want, problems they might have, and how our solutions can solve it? By the way, our reps don't know that stuff typically. They might know some high level, but they don't want to go do something with it. We do. So go do it. And so we really push our teams to get a little innovative try some different things. You know, I'll use a very proprietary thing that won't make sense to many people. Like right now, our SC team has been running for the last six months or so, what we call a GoPro campaign. Nothing to do with the cameras, by the way. We have a pro version of a lot of our SKUs. And so we want to have our customers go pro with them. And it's a pure SC-led, pre-sales-led marketing campaign that is driven let's just say lots without me getting into all the details of the money side of the house, right? And to me, that's one of the great areas. And our sales teams go like, oh, that's really valuable. I want to continue to invest in those things, okay? I think that's just one example. I think I could come up with all kinds. I really appreciate breaking that down. I like what you talked about the three components that you can't just be, but you have to be all three. I like what you talked about pushing innovation because I feel like that is what organizations look at the pre-sales teams to be. Like I've always thought is art of the possible. Our team should be able to take what product's doing, take what the salespeople are selling and customers are implementing and amplify it. And then you show something that's shiny and possible. And people are like, wow. I remember one time at Showpad, I don't know, a very talented person on my team. And he built a couple of things that our co-founder didn't even know was possible. And we presented it at an all-company event. And I got a text after it was like, holy shit, I didn't even know we could do that. And we went out and started selling it, right? And so that pre-sales innovation center, I like that you said that because that does help with the seat of the table, helps with the justification. For sure. And we do the exact same thing, paired that almost exact example early on in the, the pandemic. Some of our SEs that were working with some of the state agencies and the healthcare organizations created our safe workplace applications that now we've commercialized and you see on TV, those came out of a bunch of SEs that said, hey, I got to go help a customer. So they went and coded it. And then engineering took it over and productized it. That innovation center is what does help with justification. I want to circle back from something that you mentioned early in the podcast is you talked about the pre-sales kickoff. You have your own tech summit coming out. Tell us a little bit more about how you've been able to have a pre-sales only event before your sales kickoff. I'll be honest uh, on two fronts. One, I'm fortunate to work at a company that's willing to invest in that because as you can imagine with 14, 1500 people, if this was non-pandemic year, so like last year, we flew all of the SEs to Vegas for three extra days of SKO. Now that's kind of debatable. It's like, really, you get to go to Vegas for three more days because what we do is Tech Summit will start before sales kickoff and we'll attach right to it. But let me get into a little bit of the history because I was not the one that came up with this idea. So I don't want to take any credit for it. Or maybe I've helped to evolve some of it. But when myself and a bunch of others were running some of the pre-sales teams at VMware way back in the day, I think I'm going to take a guess that probably in the 06, 07 timeframe, 
we were seeing a couple of things. One, we were getting invited to sales kickoff, which was great. We'd go to all the same sessions as the reps and be like, are you kidding me? Why am I sitting through these like basic as it gets either a product demo or very super high superficial positioning? And yet we were getting pounded because we didn't have the time to learn some of the new products we were shipping or the new versions or, you know, whatever it may be. And I think that's where the genesis of like, Hey, let's do a tech summit. So. I don't even remember because it's 15 years ago, but my guess is we started with an extra day where maybe there was some quick keynote and then we sent them off probably to labs. And that was the big focus. We truly, and by the way, imagine this is before the cloud and Amazon and all that. We literally shipped in gear to probably four or 500 SEs. Yeah, servers all over the place. And wow. you had to bring your laptop. I remember them taking big pictures of all the servers we'd have sitting, you know, with storage and we had sponsors and all that. And we would run lab sessions. From that, we kind of evolved it at VMware. And then when myself and Scott Harvey came over to ServiceNow, both of us were over at VMware, we said, hey, let's do this. And I think ServiceNow is already doing something in this realm, but it wasn't nearly as formalized as what Tech Summit is today. And over the years, yeah, we've just evolved it to where now today... It's a good mix. So we typically do a third, two thirds. And the third is sort of soft skills training. So we focus on things like discovery, how to do positioning, value, presentation skills. It just depends on what's our sort of hot thing for the year. This year for us, it's storytelling. And then the other two thirds will be labs. So I think there's like 50 different sessions that have all been created by other SEs, product engineering, product marketing. We kind of get the whole company really to help us with this. And then you get into your agenda builder and you have six slots that you've got to go fill up and fill up your agenda and you go to sessions. And those sessions can be ranked by 100, 200, 300. It's like, I want to be a deep expert in this particular product because I get a lot of it or I'm a specialist or it might be positioning in an industry it just kind of depends, right? The agenda has all kinds of stuff sitting in there. And it's a full three-day event. And like I said, if it was in Vegas, it'd be a little more on the fun side too. But we kind of had to cut some of that out. That's incredible. That's real buy-in because there's so many organizations, big organizations too, that invest in the pre-sales and then just send their pre-sales people to one or two sessions at sales kickoff. And you actually got your CEO to come and present to your teams, yeah, the CEO is going to help me kick it off. About 50% of it is Bill McDermott and I really talking about our industry and pre-sales in particular of what are his thoughts and the value proposition. I mean, he's well aware of what we do and he's heavily bought into the value proposition of the pre-sales organization. So yeah. That's executive buy-in right there. I mean, to have Bill show up at your event and talk to kick you off. It's not like, hey, we got a couple of days. We're going to go and do our own thing. I mean, you have the head of the company coming to share. That's incredible. Good for you. We're fortunate to have exec buy-in for sure. And and, and just in general, uh, like I said, the chief revenue officer, who's my boss, Kevin Haverty, he's heavily bought in. You know, it's even kind of a funny one. It's sort of like a lot of people in the company, they want to attend Tech Summit. We actually have to be careful, you know, outside of the SE org. They give us, like I think, like 100 extra slots. Well, we filled those out really quickly. And we got to get into like, hey, listen, this is for us to do things. So it's kind of cool it's to us. be in that situation. Yeah. Like, we need to run our own deal over here. The other one, maybe even as advice for others, if you can't get an org to buy into doing a big tech summit, one thing that we were doing as well is when sales kickoff is ongoing, we would sub out most of the sessions within SKL. So, you know, you want your SCs to participate in the big regional events and the big keynotes and those things, just like any other sales rep would, et cetera. But when it got to those specific sessions, things like configuration, pricing, packaging. Those are kind of sales things. I mean, it's good for us to know, but why are we going to Vegas to learn about that? Or how does our CRM system work and how you do forecasting and blah, like why are SEs going to those things? So what we did was during the actual SKO, we would grab the majority of those breakout slots and put Tech Summit slots into it. So Tech Summit would lean right into SKO and we'd run those so that we could get more content out and not bore our SEs with a bunch of level zero based positioning that if they don't know, I'd fire them literally at this point anyway. Jeff, I was literally gonna ask you advice for people who are struggling with that. So I appreciate you throwing that up for us. You're right, because there's so many companies that send all their employees to sales kickoff. Sales kickoff is built for your sales team, your sellers, maybe your BDRs, but never the pre-sales. And I think, again, this is why pre-sales collective exists and this is what we're trying to do. So appreciate that actionable feedback. I do have one thing before we sign off, Jeff. We actually just announced a pre-sales collective advisory board and you've joined 
of one of three people, you, Dave Maloof, and Cindy Goodwin Sack. And so one, I just want to say thanks for that. What started as cold outreach via LinkedIn to get you involved in the exec summit has really turned into a uh, awesome, awesome partnership. And we really appreciate that. So I actually just want to ask you why you're getting involved and why you know, you're giving your time to the pre-sales collective. I appreciate that. And I've met the other two folks as well in the, the council and obviously yourself and UG. I think you guys are doing some interesting things. I think there is a lack of awareness globally in what we do. And I'm pretty invested both from a, a really selfish standpoint and a non-selfish standpoint in growing the pre-sales world. So the selfish side, hey, I work at a pretty big company. We plan to hire 350 new SEs in 2021. I got to go to recruit them somewhere. So Pretty sure this helps me recruit. I'm not going to lie. Okay. I and mean, it helps my team recruit and it makes the pot bigger for everybody. And I guess that's bleeds into that non-selfish piece that if we can get things like universities and colleges globally to help build programs, which I'm even attempting to do at some small levels that we can talk about another time and get this to a place where people want to do this without us having to first teach them. What is this thing? And I'm sure everybody that's listened to it gets what I mean when I say everybody knows what a sales rep is or close enough, right? Because they've had to deal with some sales rep at some point in their life, but they go pre-sales and they go, unless you're really in the, like the software industry, hardware, or maybe a few others, they go like, what, what is, what is a pre-sale? What the hell does that mean? And then you're sitting and explaining for the next three minutes. And then they still get this like, what? like what kind of property you got? Do you need like two people? What is that all about? Right. And so I just have this huge personal interest in helping to grow it. Cause I find and feel that the pre-sales industry has given a lot to me personally. And, and why not go give some back the knowledge that I have or the experiences? Yes. I use them to our competitive advantages at my current employer being serviced now. So I'll hold on to a few of those, but why not share the majority of them? As long as it's not NDA proprietary type stuff, I like the tech summit thing. Why, why wouldn't you do that everywhere? Now, good luck trying to go and convince everybody to get you to do that. I can't help you there. That's a tough road, but you know, why not? So let's share and get better. Jeff, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate this conversation. Great to hear your perspective. Great to have you involved and good luck at the Tech Summit. Appreciate it. Uh, have a great 2021, everybody. Can't be worse than 2020, right? All right, Jeff. Thanks for the time. See you next time. All right, Pre-Sales Collective. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I love talking to Jeff. Jeff's got incredible experience and I've been very fortunate to get to know Jeff through the Pre-Sales Collective. What started as a cold outbound message on LinkedIn to bring awareness to the Executive Summit has turned into Jeff joining our advisory board for Pre-Sales Collective. And you heard him talk about why he's doing that and why he's giving back. And it's a benefit to him as well. And we're really excited to have Jeff involved because he's got so much great experience. Some of the things he talked about was that Pre-Sales Collective is the technical backstop of an organization and that we're the CTOs of our own region. I love that. That's a great way to classify our role for any organization, whether you're tech savvy or biz savvy, that technical backstop still exists. We talked about quota and sales and priorities and sales being number one. And he mentioned a quote from Bill McDermott, which says, you can't do good until you do well. And that really resonated with me because as organizations, we still are aligned to the sales number. We have to be closing business, helping customers, and driving that growth so that we can create better ratios or help build the pre-sales org. Jeff talked a lot about pushing innovation and making sure that your pre-sales team is an innovator. He mentioned the three things that he said, don't be a demo monkey, a POC god, and a product expert, even though you have to be all three, but you have to be more. And the idea of pushing innovation is something that I think organizations expect our pre-sales teams to do because we are the gap of what's in the field and what's happening behind the scenes, whether that's product marketing, product management, we really do fill that gap. And Jeff talked about getting a seat at the executive table. Jeff's job is to go and fight for his org and talk about how solutions consulting is different than just sales. And he's done a really great job of that. And I love that he has the tech summit happening. The tech summit, in my opinion, is such a win for pre-sales organizations. And we talk about this type of awareness component in multiple podcasts on multiple mediums. And the idea that you're going to fly everyone to Las Vegas 
for your sales kickoff, but then give your pre-sales team two or three days prior to focus on what matters to them. That is an incredible investment. And I hope we see that as a growing and more common thread. No more just, hey, here's your one or two sessions in the small boardroom. Let's get multi-day events geared toward our pre-sales profession. All right, Pre-Sales Collective, I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. As always, like, share the podcast. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.